It was like something out of a horror movie. I just saw this guy walking by himself, noticed he had a bulging wallet in his back pocket, and held him up. You know, as you do. It should have been a simple transaction. Your money or your life, as old stories used to go. Well, it got weird fucking quickly. The previously clear, still night filled with a baying howl of whines and, I don't know, two dozen dogs? The small black guy just stared at me. His face was changing, becoming less or more. I don't know. He looked like a Rottweiler. He, he told me, remember this. You fuck with a rat, you'd better learn to run. I felt something in me breaking, and I was running. I shouldn't have looked behind me. I don't know how many dogs were chasing me down the fucking high street, but loads of people saw it. And I screamed and spluttered and cried out for help. When those dogs brought me down and started biting me, I thought they'd eat me alive, but the weirdest thing, it's its like they knew when to stop. They just, they just fucked me up. Now look at me. No fingers, no toes, no fucking nose or ears. I still see that motherfucker's staring eyes whenever I blink, and I hear those fucking dogs whenever I sleep. Greetings, kindred. I am Voivode Maquette, and welcome back to Our World of Darkness. Today we're going to have a discussion about the disciplines, one in particular. A viewer, Ethan Zakowski, asked me if I would review my thoughts on the way animalism can actually be used against animals, other kindred, and the kind. And I thought that that was a damn good idea. So, I've got myself a glass of something red, and I'm going to sit back and have that discussion. Discussion on the disciplines. Animalism is a discipline that's close to my heart. and. I'm not just saying that because that's the discipline that I'm reading today. I'm, I'm saying that because my two favorite clans practice animalism. The Zemitsi and the Gangrel. But they are by no means the only ones that do. Animalism is versatile. Animalism is it's a way for a kindred to tap in. To the very essence of the beast itself and bring it forth you're you're proving that you are the bigger predator for better or for worse the beast of other animals listens to you the way that animalism is presented in vampire the masquerade fifth edition is beautiful there's many aspects that they've honed in on and put more detail into. There's more aspects that they added to make the game more fulfilled, to make you a more terrifying bestial predator. Whether you call it doolittling, taming, or beastay sermo, animalism is definitely something to be feared and respected. Always keep that in mind. I've always found it interesting when people say you need to have a healthy fear of specific animals. Snakes, spiders, whatever. I've always said that you need to have a healthy respect for them. But, of course, I, as a person outside of Vampire the Masquerade, uh, outside of the world of darkness, have spent many years working with animals in one form or another. I could never see myself not being with them. Um, I've worked in zoos, I've worked in pet stores, um, I've worked in training facilities and grooming facilities. I, I have a knack for dealing with the wild animals. I feel that I have a, an understanding and a kinship with them. Most people that I have met who play Vampire the Masquerade or games similar have always compared their lives and said, what power would you have? What discipline would you have? Uh, when it comes to you as an individual. And they've always given their two cents on the 
opinion also of what discipline that I would have. And most people who know me would say that I definitely would have animalism, which I quite enjoy. The book. Obviously, we're going to read through what the book says. Because the book is our source of lore. Perhaps the vampire has more in common with the animal than human. A dangerous set of instincts drive them, and it takes a lot for them to withhold the urge to just lash out. Much like a wild dog on a chain, a vampire's beast will never truly be tamed. Some kindred find a way of becoming one with their beasts, those who do are the masters of animalism. Some accompany this power with howls and snarls and roars, or communicate with animals in the animal's language, though this is an affectionation and not a necessity. The animalism discipline seeks much use among vampires who struggle to fit in or have no taste for living among mortals often classed as one of Cain's gifts of utility, allowing a vampire to thrive on unrefined blood or form companionship with non-sapient beings. It is also a devastating weapon against vampires who cling to their towers, and against inquisitioners who suspect their enemies were only come on two legs. A swarm of blood-hungry rats invading a kindred's penthouse haven. The animalism-proficient vampire who cows the sheriff's beast in Elysium. Or the beady-eyed raven that spies on a society of St. Leopold chapter all serve to strengthen animalism practitioners and weaken their foes. I find the description poetic, well-written, much like I do, most things that are located in the v5 uh, material however i do find it limiting but that is primarily because i find that different clans tend to use them in different ways the zamitsi for one are going to become the masters of beasts and men uh, which is why i don't have a problem with them having animalism and dominate in this system the Gangrel are going to look at it more as a cause for survival, um, possibly companionship, but mostly, mostly for survival. Having one's pack with you is definitely a way to survive, after all. And then there's the Nosferatu. Clan Nosferatu are going to use animalism in a whole new way. They're going to find ways to relate and commune with the lower beasts whether it's because they need the companionship or because it's the only way they can find a way to truly connect on a more primal level that they're not going to find in the halls of Elysium with the sophisticated vampires. Now, the characteristics of animalism are quite easy to tell um, due to the fact that it's, it's animalism you're going to be interacting with the beast in some fashion. By default, animalism powers involving animals can only be used on vertebrates. Additionally, any use of this ability on herbivores adds one to the difficulty of skill rolls involved. That is, um, that's an interesting tidbit to add to the discipline of animalism, especially since in my own games in the past, I have strictly limited the use of animalism to predators and scavengers. Um, I've never truly said whether or not it has to be an herbivore or a carnivore, but I like the fact that that's in there because it does imply that it's a predator of some sort or a scavenger of some sort. Now, what I mean by that is I can picture a gangrel communicating with a wolf or a dog or cat or a bear or something like that 
And I'm, I'm limiting myself on that one. I can see most clans who have this gift communicating with animals like that. Could you imagine a vampire in communication with a deer? Typically, I would say no. However, there are breeds of deer that have been known to kill and eat smaller animals. Not all deer are vegetarians. So, I would imagine that it would have more to do with which type of animal you're talking to and not just the overarching uh, possibilities of what the discipline has to say or what the, the overarching abilities of what the discipline has to do. Um, but I do believe that something that has more of a violent source of sustenance in its blood seems to be more appropriate. It's marked as a mental type discipline, which I find very humorous, because when you look at the actual levels of the discipline, you are looking more on charisma-based uh, tests, though you do have some resolve, but limiting a discipline to a attribute category can be a little iffy because they are going to change depending on what you're doing with them. This discipline, a masquerade threat, it is low to medium. While talking to an animal might seem eccentric, only the most violent applications of this discipline elicit more than a few raised eyebrows. I don't know how many times I've walked down the road and seen someone speaking to the dog that they're walking or to the parrot that's on their shoulder. Blood resonance. Animal blood. Preferably feral. To make it easier to learn this discipline, it's good to feed on more of the wild, non-domesticated bloods. The vintage does matter in this system, after all. I do like the fact that to learn disciplines, it does specify that you have to choose what you eat a little bit more than just willy-nilly I have this in my blood. I like the fact that you have to charge your blood. And that's how I see resonance acting, is you're acclimating your blood to a specific discipline. And in the times that Cain walked the earth, if he ever truly did, uh, and learned these disciplines, I can see him needing those uh, that special acclimation, not just feeding on humans all the time. Now getting into what the discipline actually truly does, mechanics-wise. Level 1, Bond Familius. When blood bonding an animal, the vampire can make it a familius, forming a mental link with it and facilitating the use of other animalism powers. While this power does not allow two-way communication with the animal. It can follow simple verbal instructions such as stay and come here. It attacks in defense of itself and its master, but cannot otherwise be persuaded to fight something it would not normally attack. If you have a bond familius, this familius is a three-point blood-bound creature to you. This animal is going to do what it can to keep you safe. However, you do have to keep in consideration that animals have a much stronger sense of instinct than humans. And where a human might do something stupid to keep you safe, uh, due to the fact that humans do not typically have the best instincts out there, an animal is, however, going to look more on personal preservation due to the fact that they have a higher set of instincts. The dice pool is Charisma plus Animalism. This is a good set because you are talking about a social leaning. You are talking about a social, a social connection between you and said animal. Cost. The animal must be fed the user's blood on three separate nights each of which requires a rouse check by the user. The amount of blood needed to sustain the ghouled state of an animal after this is negligible. 
Players starting with this power have completed this process and can choose a Familius for free. I don't see why not. I think that's the same idea as starting with a ghoul that you've had for a while, as long as you're not embraced that night, or it, you, as long as you're not like a month embraced. I do not see a problem with that whatsoever. Mm. However, finding the Familius can lead to such rich story potential. System. Without the use of Feral Whispers, giving commands to the animal requires a Charisma plus Animal Can roll. Difficulty 2. Increase the difficulty for more complex orders. And that has more to do with the understanding, not the inability to do them or the strength of your bond, but your complex orders needs to be understood to them. A vampire can only have one familius, but can get a new one if the current one dies. A vampire can use feral whispers, animalism 2, and subsume the spirit, animalism 4, on their familius for free. That's nice. That's nice. We'll get into what uh, subsume the spirit actually does for you, but feral whispers is pretty typical, where you speak and they understand you, where you can growl or use body language and stuff. We'll get into all of that. Duration. Only death releases a familius once bound. As long as it receives vampire blood on a regular basis, the familius does not age. You've ghouled this animal. And it's more than just a standard ghoul. It has a higher understanding of you and an emotional connection with you. This does not say that you cannot ghoul other animals, but you will never have a bond quite profound as with your familius. Uh, specifically speaking, being able to subsume the spirit, which if my memory is, is playing proper, uh, putting your soul within its body for taking advantage of its shape, and feral whispers being able to communicate with them directly um, in a mental in a mental capacity. Ah, I do love this one. Sense the beast. The vampire can sense the beast present in mortals, vampires, and other supernaturals, gaining a sense of their nature, hunger, and hostility. I like this one because it very much reminds me of the first level of Protean, um, from Requiem. I liked the fact that they, they basically just got rid of um, Eyes of the Beast and they made it so that you could sense a vampire just by being in their presence. You'd know exactly who they are because your beast calls out to them. In Vampire the, in, uh, vampire the Requiem, the first time that two vampires would come together, there was an immediate frenzy check. It was the flight or fight response, which I enjoyed because of the concept of conflict, but I didn't like also because it just seemed like it was out of nowhere a lot of the time. Um, but in a situation where you're playing a gangrel in Requiem, you could just walk up and go, oh, you're a vampire and I don't care. It was literally, I don't care. So, the cost is free. This is an automatic discipline, which is always nice. Dice pool. Resolve plus animalism versus the composure and subterfuge of the target. The system. You roll your resolve plus animalism versus the composure and subterfuge. A win allows the user to sense the level of hostility in a target. Whether the person is prepared to do harm or even determined to cause it, and determine whether they harbor a supernatural beast, marking them as a vampire or werewolf. On a whim, 
A critical gives you information on the exact type of creature, as well as their hunger or rage level. This power can be used both actively or passively, warning the user of aggressive intents in their immediate vicinity. Duration passive. I like this for a couple of dis different reasons. I, I like it due to the fact that it brings back the one of the few things I actually truly enjoyed about Requiem into Masquerade, which is the Sense of the Beast thing. But also, the other reason I like it is that it gives us a bit of a glimpse at what we might be looking forward to, to W5, or Werewolf the Apocalypse 5th Edition. The idea that blood, uh, that your hunger rating is in relation to the rage rating is a very interesting uh, concept because I do I, I look very forward to seeing how these two games can interact with each other. Um, I've run games before uh, with werewolf storytellers who have uh, worked alongside me in the past and we've created some amazing storylines and Having access to that for Vampire the Masquerade 5th Edition is something that I look forward to very much. Level 2, Feral Whispers. The vampire can commune with the beasts of the wild and the city. Feral Whispers allows two-way communication with animals. A cat might not be interested in debating Matisse's use of color, but happily discuss the lack of prey around the brownstone building across the street. Depending on the vampire's skill, they can even persuade animals to perform services, like humans. Animals seldom agree to things that go against their nature or endanger them. Vampires can also use feral whispers to summon a chosen type of animal. But the animals must be present to answer. Nothing prevents a vampire trying to summon an orca in Central Park, but success seems unlikely. Summoned animals must listen to the summoner, but scatter or attack if endangered. This is a very interesting thing because it's a mix between feral whispers and summon um or noah's call if you look at the dark ages uh it's a it's a it's an interesting way of just saying that those two disciplines were the same thing you just had to talk louder and i also like the fact that it does say that it does state that nothing is stopping you from doing something other than the fact of probability of the target animal coming to you. If you are in a city, you might be able to summon a pack of dogs. If you are in a city, you could probably summon rats. Pigeons can be quite voracious, I've seen. Um, these are all possible things, but like it says, an orca is very unlikely. However, if you are on the Pacific Northwest of the United States, and you happen to be near a ocean of some kind and there happens to be a, po a pod of orca traveling by there's no reason why they would not listen to you it's, it's interesting to think of marine animals when it comes to the gangrel but or when it comes to vampires but there is that bloodline called the mariners which is uh, something interesting to take into consideration also it works very much as the presence discipline of awe where you've got their attention it doesn't necessarily mean that you have their loyalty dice pool is manipulation plus animalism or charisma plus animalism in that i would say that it depends on the test are you trying to gain the upper hand in a social conflict um with these animals or are you trying to are you trying to fool them? Are you trying to lie to them? That is a that is a very nice um, thought. In this in this case, I would not take it as the higher uh, the higher attribute. 
I would say more of the appropriate attribute. Cost. One rouse check per type of animal chosen for the scene. Allows one summoning and unlimited communication. Free when use on Familius. I like the fact that you also don't have to continuously do tests. That was something that was very annoying in the old systems that I used to play in, is that every time I wanted to issue another command, or any time that I wanted to get more information, it was more and more and more tests. Um, where this system is very streamlined when it comes to, oh, you've activated the discipline, it's good for the scene. You don't actually have to spend the cost again. You don't actually have to go through the motions again. It's more story and not system. Simple communication requires no dice pool test. Persuading an animal to perform a service requires a manipulation plus animalism role. The difficulty depends on the task required. Having a bird keep an eye out for anyone entering the park at night is a difficulty of three, while ordering any animal to defend a place with their lives is a difficulty of six. Summoning animals uses a charisma plus animalism role. Difficulty depends on the scarcity of the animal summon. The number of animals summoned depends on the margin of the test. A critical win summons most, if not all, animals of the type in an area. Duration one scene. Okay, so it, it does go a little bit more into detail where it does say that if you are summoning, then it's charisma. You're coaching to bring them in. So I can understand that. Getting them to do things is more of a manipulation. So perhaps I misspoke on that one and I'm completely fine with that. I like learning new things. So, level three, animal succulents. The vampire can slake additional hunger by feeding on animals. In addition, the vampire can consume its familius, gaining nourishment far beyond would be, be gained from an animal of similar stature and absorbing a sliver of its primary trait. That's interesting, and I'm wondering exactly what that is going to resolve in the, uh, in the system. Eating your own familius is... I would see that as a last-ditch effort, but we'll see exactly what it has to say. The cost is free. System. Feeding from animals slakes one additional hunger. And the vampire counts their blood potency as two levels lower in regards to penalties on slaking hunger from animal blood. That's nice. I like the fact that it's just not you just receive normal stuff from animals. I like that because there should still be a difficulty when it comes to feeding on animals uh, compared to humans. Consuming one's familius slakes for hunger regardless of the animal's size. Wow. This act can never remove the final hunger die. In addition, consuming one's familius increases the vampire's attribute most associated with that animal, as determined by the storyteller, by two dots. Consuming a cat might raise your dexterity or composure. Consuming a dog might raise your charisma or resolve. Storytellers may vary the reward from familiar consumption. Draining an owl might raise the attribute in any perception pools by two dots, or in pools involving wise decision making. The bonus lasts until the vampire's next feeding or until their hunger reaches five duration passive that is interesting i like the fact that you get extra bonus if you do feed from your familius and i can see certain vampires doing that on purpose prepping and raising and the reason i can see that is because i can see vampires doing that with their own child or the idea that you are grooming a child to be a specific thing so you can eat them. So that they will give off the proper 
capabilities. Because having specific animals for specific purposes, it's going to take three nights in preparation to make a familius. And if you're playing the long game, especially a vampire who is that detached from humanity, where they themselves are the only thing that truly matters, regardless of how long they've kept these animals, that can lead to some pretty interesting thoughts of, oh, I've, I've got a herd of, we'll use cats as an example, the idea of I need to make sure that I'm at ease. Well, this cat, uh, uh, let's just say next, next Elysium, I need to make sure I'm at ease. And this cat, this cat has a high resolve. So, I'm going to spend this week getting to know this cat, to grooming him and gaining his trust. Just so, on the night of Elysium, I can drain him. Not only am I bringing my hunger to a point where I'm not going to show up to Elysium in a rude fashion, but I'm going to be able to keep my composure down. I can actually see a lot of Zamitsi doing something like that, specifically because of interactions with the Ivory Tower now that the Lasombra are starting to weasel their way in there. I don't know if any Zamitsi may actually be perturbed about the situation. Quell the Beast, also a level 3, by locking eyes with a target, the vampire cows their inner beast into temporary slumber. Mortals affected thus become apathetic, unable to take any action other than to stay alive, while vampires' bestial urges temporarily abate for better or worse. Quill the Beast has always been a very interesting discipline to me. It works almost as if uh, you're using a dominate command on a human. And being able to remove a vampire's ability to um, call on that extra oomph that the beast can give you from time to time is very nice. Cost one rouse check. Dice pool charisma plus animalism versus stamina plus resolve. That's an interesting idea is that you're doing this against their, their stamina. It's a physical challenge. You don't, in, in the old system, you don't see many social versus physical challenges, and I, I kind of enjoy that. System. Roll charisma plus animalism versus stamina plus resolve. A win against a mortal target incapacitates them for the scene, instilling severe lethargy. They act only to preserve themselves, not against the user or, any, or anyone else. A win against a vampire prevents the target from performing a blood surge. While their beast is quelled, vampires do not score messy criticals. Against vampires, this power lasts a turn, plus a number of turns equal to the win margin on the contest. A critical win against a vampire target also ends their frenzy. Duration one scene or a number of turns equal to the test margin plus one. That's interesting because I know in the past I have used Quell the Beast to stop a vampire's frenzy. And now you actually specifically have to get a critical win. That makes it a little bit more messy. It makes it a little bit more risky. I'm not saying that I don't like it. As a storyteller, I cannot say that I don't like it. As a player, I can make t tell you that it makes me very nervous. But, also, the idea of using Quell the Beast and being able to stop someone from using a blood surge is very nice, especially in situations when you're fighting perhaps someone who's a higher blood potency than you. Oh. Now we start getting to some fun things. Unliving Hive, also a level three, but it's our first amalgam that we're looking at. This takes Offuscate two, most often seen among the Nosferatu. This unnerving power allows the user to extend their animal influence 
to swarms of insects, such as flies or roaches. Certain vampires even go so far as to adopt swarms of familiae, giving them a permanent home within the folds and orifices of their malformed flesh. Why I love this. I love this so much because there were two things that I used to take on the very rare occasion that I would play a Nosferatu. And that is Swarm Attractor, which means that there's always a buzzing of gnats, flies, mosquitoes, something like that around you. You, they stay with you and also they cause people to be two traits down when attacking you because they will defend their that they will defend you i loved it i loved having that power and the fact that it does not exist in um fifth edition kind of makes me sad but unliving hive makes up for that because the other thing i would always take was parasitic infestation Parasitic infestation, if I remember correctly, was a two-point flaw that basically meant that you had a parasitic infestation within your skin and that people could see things crawling underneath you. It was such a great thing for an Osferatu to have because it was so nasty. I would take that and just play off as a standard-looking human, but my skin would crawl from time to time. And if I was ever attacked, the swarm, which had made its home inside my body, would come out and attack. And I fucking loved it it was disgusting it was disturbing it made a couple of storytellers a little squeamish and not want to work with me i loved it it's so much fun i love making storytellers feel uncomfortable now another thing about parasitic infestation also means that you lost a blood trait you basically were always a blood trait down when you woke up because the parasitic infestation would feed off of you and uh it's this discipline is that combo of merit and flaw that I used to take that I loved so much. So I'm so excited to see that somebody at the World of Darkness had the same mentality as I did when it came to playing a Nosferatu. Now, it doesn't say that you cannot play other clans with this. This is some, I could definitely see a Zemitsi with something like this. I could definitely see a, a Gangrel do something like this when they've just given up. It's just like, I don't want to act human anymore. And I've, I've chosen to be more of a, va of a vampire who's devoted to more of an insect lifestyle. Uh, in the old Sabbat books, there used to be discussions of insect-like gangrel, giant wasps and spiders and things like that. And this would be just so much fun to have, is that you are the nest. So, moving on. Cost. No additional cost. System. This power extends all powers previously restricted to vertebrates to insect swarms. Training a swarm as a single creature. The vampire can bind the swarm as their familius, and some even give it the ability to nest inside the cavities of their body. This hides the swarm from sight, while allowing to nurse the minute amounts of blood it needed to sustain indefinitely. While nesting, the swarm is undetectable by anything less than x-rays. Swarms do little damage in combat. They have health 5 and a pool of 8 dice to resist attacks. Swarms take superficial damage from brawl. Flame and insecticide cause aggravated damage. Vampires can use swarms for spying as distractions, resulting in a two-dice penalty on any roll for a single swarmed individual, or to intimidate mortals. Add between one and three dice to intimidation pools, depending on the type of insect and the victim's phobias. I do like how they... They specifically say the victim's phobias. Players and storytellers can doubtlessly come up with even more creative uses of this power. Duration, passive. I'm so amused by this. I really wish that I had more of a temperament to play Nosferatu. I've played Nosferatu maybe two or three times in my life, 
and um, I just don't get as much out of it. I, I see the appeal, I highly do, but I tend to, oh, let's be a little bit blunt on this one. The last time I played a Nosferatu, um, it was in a V20 game, a Vampire the Masquerade 20th edition game, and I was confronted by a girl um, who came up to me, a young lady who came up to me, and told me that she did not understand why anybody could play it. She broke character to tell me that I shouldn't be playing a Nosferatu. And where I am flattered that um, she had a hard time seeing me as such. Um, it also just kind of like eh, shook me to the point where I decided to not hang out on that side as much. Um, I love I love the Nosferatu because playing the monster either a monster who embraces the fact that they are the monster or the monster who is the monster on the outside but not on the inside. The Beauty of the Beast role is so much of an interesting thing. Not to mention, Nosferatu have one of the best power sets ever. If I was ever playing Katif, Potence, Animalism, and Offuscate are definitely some damn disciplines I would take because those are just wonderful, wonderful disciplines. So, moving on. We are now on level four, Subsume the Spirit. The vampire can completely transfer his mind into the body of an animal. They can control the animal and use its senses freely, even during the day, should they manage to stay awake. While doing this, the vampire's body lies immobile, as if in torpor. I highly suggest having ghouls when you use something like this. Or, having a locked and secure room with a small secure exit that your animal form can get out of. Because the idea of... I mean, what are you going to do? You're going to transfer yourself into a dog's body and then, what, drag yourself somewhere and keep you safe? Bury yourself? Just make sure you're set. That's all. The... The cost. One rouse check or free if used on Familius. I do like the fact that the Familius keeps popping up. It does give it more and more benefits to having that power. Because truthfully, I would always take Sense the Beast. Um, just double checking. Yeah. I would always take Sense the Beast over Bond Familius. Just because it's such a useful power. To be able to just know what the hell's going on at all times. You're always on your guard. But Bond Familius does definitely have benefits when you're looking towards later disciplines. The dice pool is manipulation plus animalism. System. Make a manipulation plus animalism test. Difficulty 4. On a win, the vampire can inhabit the animal's body for one scene. On a critical win, the vampire can inhabit the animal indefinitely. Holy shit. Extending this possession into the daylight hours requires the vampire to stay awake. As per rules that are located on page 219. Seeing the sun requires a test of fear frenzy, though the sunlight does not damage the animal being ridden. The user remains oblivious to their original body, but harm to it pulls them out of the trance and releases the animal. Death of the possessed animal also ends the trance, and the vampire takes a point of aggravated willpower damage from the shock. Duration a scene or indefinitely. See above. I like the idea of the vampire who has decided, fuck it, I'm a dog now. I really do. I think it kind of brings me back to uh, the What We Do in the Shadows movie. Um, it was like, what did you do last night? Well, I turned into a dog and had sex. <laughs> it's 
It's amusing. If you haven't seen it, I highly suggest it. Great damn movie. Do it. Also, I might be wrong. It has been a little bit of a while. It has been a while since I've played the old version of Vampire the Masquerade, but it says here that if the animal dies, you get whiplash to your regular body and take a, a point of aggravated willpower damage, which I like. I'm not complaining about that. I'm pretty sure the old version said that you were whiplashed to your old body and you entered torpor. Suck. Um, which I felt a little damning, I think, at the time. Um, because a lot of vampires I could see doing this for kamikaze missions. I'm going to sacrifice a willpower to make sure that this animal walks into Elysium with C4 strapped to it. It's something that I can see happen. And um, I'm not saying that I would personally do that, but I can also see it happening. Level 5. Animal Dominion. The power the vampire holds over beasts is now great enough to command flocks and packs as if it were an extension of their own body. At a gesture, animals lay down their lives by the dozens, even hundreds, to appease their master. I love all of that because it makes me think of the vampire movies where the vampire would like raise their arms, spread their cape, and bats would just fly out everywhere and attack. The, 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 the scene in Venice um, in League of Extraordinary Gentlemen when when Mina flies through the air and there's just bats all over the goddamn place. I just, I love it. I love the concept of that. Or the scene in Dracula where he's in the, where he's in the dark corner and when they turn the light on him, he just like pours rats. Um, that just, that's just a lot of fun and a lot of, a lot interesting. Uh, the word flock bothers me so much because I just see geese and it's so hard not to just go, God, they're evil as they are and they don't need to be vampires. The cost is two rouse checks. The dice pool is charisma plus animalism. Two is understandable if you're talking about an entire army of animals here. System. Choose a type of animal and make a charisma plus animalism roll with a difficulty depending on the nature of the animals and the order given. That's nice. It's It kind of works like um, the summoning aspect of... Uh, it kind of works with the like the summoning aspect of Feral Whispers, but the difficulty is more malleable depending on what your storyteller thinks for the situation, which I, I do enjoy. Getting a flock of crows to disperse and look for a specific individual, given some means of identifying their target, is relatively easy, difficulty of three. But getting a pack of dogs to give their lives in a suicidal attack on another vampire is more of a challenge. Difficulty of five. The power does not allow a user to summon animals, but compels those already present to obey. The vampire can command the animals to return after completing their task, if they have means to do so. Duration, a single scene or until the directive is fulfilled, whichever is shortest. Um, that's, that's interesting because it's a, it's a nonchalant combo discipline. Um, you want to use feral whispers to summon them to you and then disperse them to handle the, the issue at hand. And it also doesn't mean that you have, it, I like the limited, I like the limit on the fact that we don't have an army of wild, rabid dogs chasing down one person forever. It only lasts the scene. Eventually the animals become bored and wander off. Or they just don't want to go any further. So it, it makes a lot of sense. I like it. It expounds and makes you a force to be reckoned with, but also does not make you ridiculously cartoony. And, I, and that's something, that's a fine line that I think that people need to understand. That is a fucking fine line that needs to be taken with disciplines is that you have the option of just making these utterly ridiculous and making them actually fit into the old world sensibilities 
the the ability to have a vampire and make it not look stupid is so hard and i commend everybody who plays and does not make their vampires look ridiculous also level five drawing out the beast the vampire can project their beast at the moment of terror or fury frenzy transferring it into a nearby subject either mortal or vampire that person immediately experiences the frenzy instead going on a merciless rampage or fleeing in terror depending on the trigger i'm a little sad that it says it only works on humans and vampires um i have to i have to go on I have to go on to say how sorry I am about that, simply because how great would it be to know that it is time for you to frenzy, that you're going to go through this. I'm going to put that on a mouse and just set it loose. Not because I want it to tear ass, but because that would be the best way for you to get rid of it. I'm going to put it in something very insignificant, something very small, that possibly I can put in a 10 gallon tank. And when it calms down, we'll talk. But, like, the idea of just being able to throw your beast into something non-dangerous. Not to make it dangerous, but to keep yourself in check is nice. But, unfortunately, it only works on vampires and humans, so it says. Uh, cost, one rouse check. That's not bad for a level five. One rouse check is nice. Dice pool, wits plus animalism versus composure plus resolve. System. Instead of the willpower roll to resist a terror or fury frenzy, roll your wits plus animalism versus the composure and resolve of the target. If the user fails, they enter frenzy as though they had failed the willpower roll. On a win, the target experiences that frenzy instead of the user. Later stimuli can still provoke frenzy in the user, but... They can use this power as long as they can make a rouse check. And further targets remain available. This power cannot transfer a hunger frenzy. Well, that makes sense. Duration. Frenzy duration. See page 222. That is the extent of what animalism has to give in Vampire the Masquerade, 5th edition. But... It is not the end of what animalism has to offer in Vampire the Masquerade 5th edition. And what I mean by that is the level 5 protean amalgam discipline. One with the land. I love the fact that this has been added into it, but not for the reasons that one might think. Now, this is a primarily aimed at clan Zamitsi discipline. But there's no reason why Gangrel couldn't take this as their level 5. Um, I don't understand exactly what World of Darkness had plans when it came to the way that their non-specific discipline amalgams had to do with their organization. I don't know if anything that would fall underneath the vicissitude uh, heading should only go to Zamitsi, or if anything that only falls under the chemistry uh, thing should only go to Ravno. Uh, but in that case, should Offuscate and Dominate Amalgam Dementation only go to Malkavians? Which personally, I think that's true. Um, as a way of handling that, I am saying that you need a teacher who already knows it if you are not of that clan. Um, but one with the land is so amazing to me because it evokes feelings of Kaldunism. And as everybody knows here, I am a Zamitsi fan. I love the clan. I think that that they snuck this in there. And I don't know exactly who wrote this, if this was Justin Achille or or what, but 
I raise my glass to you because this is an amazing thing that makes me feel like Kaldunism is at least being represented. Now, level five, one with the land. Amalgam, animalism two. Prerequisites, earth melt. The kindred possesses such mastery over their own form that they may extend it even into their domain itself. Not only may the vampire sink into the very earth, they maintain a preternatural awareness of events transpiring within their domain. If that doesn't sound like way of spirit, I don't know what does. Cost, two rouse checks. System, as with Earthmeld, see Vampire the Masquerade, core book, page 270. Except the vampire is not limited by the makeup of the surface where they take their rest. Some vampires have been known to suffuse themselves into the walls of their mansions, while others secret themselves beneath the warped floorboards of a squat, or even hide beneath the shallow pools of dead water. That's also interesting to me because there is a way of water where you effectively earth meld into water. So more, more caldunism, but also because gangrel, I don't know, um, I'd have to double check to see if these are actual rules, but in um, in the old games that I would play in, one of uh, I enjoyed playing um, Gangrel Anti Tribute from time to time. They would allow us to meld into concrete. Um, that that's one of the benefits of being an Anti Tribute Gangrel is that you could sink into concrete um, as you would with standard Earth Meld. Also in Requiem. And again, I don't know if this was uh, just house rules or what, but considering the fact that it was it was a Camarilla sanctioned game, I would assume that this was ruling that in Requiem, if you had Earth Meld, you could buy it repeatedly um, for the different substances. Like you could buy, here's Earth Meld, you can sink into the earth. Here's Earth Meld, you can now sink into rock. Here's Earth Meld, you can now sink into wood. I think it had to be natural material i'm not 100 percent sure but i do remember that was a thing and i found that to be very fun when i was playing gangrel in requiem additionally in a distance of one mile in any direction from where the vampire's body has become one with the land the vampire may elect to experience any sensory stimuli within that area such as listening to a conversation therein physically enjoying a lover lover's tryst or catching the scent of a fire that an unruly mob may be stoking. The vampire experiences these senses through the presence of animals, however minute, in the vicinity of the event. If the events are discreet or intentionally hidden, a wits plus animalism test versus the relevant opposing dice pool used as required. Rising from this state before nightfall, the day after it has been entered requires a resolve plus protean test at a difficulty of four. And even then, it can take up to an hour for the vampire to fully reemerge. A, criti a critical win allows them to rise instantly, however. Duration? One day or more or until physically disturbed. I just, I love that discipline and I'm so glad that it's there. And the fact that it's a protean animalism mix is is very interesting because it does seem like a, a spiritual practice. It does seem like something that the Zemitsi would have cultivated to spy and to just know what's going around. Um, the fact that it says that in a distance of one mile in any direction 
um, gives me the impression. Please correct me if I'm wrong. I do, and I actually enjoy that. I do like being told that I've misinterpreted something. And if I find that you've misinterpreted something, I would love to have a debate. But I do find that that means that it's a one mile area. Now, in Way of Spirit Kaldunism, it used to be in old Kaldunism, one mile per level of Kaldunism you possessed. And that's Kaldunism itself, not your different paths. So you'd be able to. I think it stretched out. I think it was actually like one mile for one, five miles for two, ten miles for three, etc. It was ridiculous. It was it was it was dumb to the point where in the old system, if you had Kaldunism, Way of Spirit, you'd actually be able to know like everything that's going on within a hundred mile radius around your uh, haven. You didn't have to actually sink in. Your eye sockets just hollowed out because for some reason Kaldunism had something to do with the eyes, at least aesthetically. Um, but I do, I love the fact that they decided to put that in there, and I don't know if Kaldunism happened to be the goal there, if they were trying to just edge into it, give the players something that resembled something that we loved that much, um, but if that was the case, I appreciate it greatly, and I thank you yet again, I raise my glass. Um... But as you can see, animalism itself is such a animalism itself is such a beautiful art form. And when you're playing a Gangrel or Nosferatu or Zemitsi or Ravno or any of the other vampires who happen to get their hands on it, it's such a useful tool. Much like all of the disciplines are, and will most likely cover all of those disciplines, but this one was specifically asked for. So, Ethan Zakowski, I hope that I've given my personal thoughts um, wrapped in well enough with what V5 has to say about it. If you are interested in any other uh, edition of Auspex, I'll be happy to go over those too if you would like. Um, but given my prime focus on the more current world of darkness, I've chosen to do V5. Um, animalism is interesting, and it gives you the ability to interact with your bestial nature better than any other discipline even although i do say that protean allows you to take that forms of other things to the higher level animalism itself is your deep down connection with your beast not your form but the actual mentality of a beast and social behavior i do like that in old systems if you used subsume the spirit you tended to take on characteristics of the animal that you are pretending to be um for extended periods of time you would pick up just almost like the beast traits um the way gangrel used to get them where it was either a social or a physical deformality, you would gain some type of mental um, apprehension when it came to uh, being a specific type of animal. If you were a dog, you maybe, maybe you would walk into Elysium and go around the chair three times before you sat down. Or maybe... <laughs> I'm getting ridiculous now, and this is this is what I was talking about when I said you need to make sure that you don't go Looney Tunes when you don't when you don't go ridiculous when you're playing Vampire the Masquerade with these disciplines because if you're a cat and you walk into a room and there's a bruja on a laptop and it's really hard to uh, not just hey I've been a cat for a few days so I'm gonna walk over I'm gonna walk over there and like lay down on their lay down on their laptop. But, uh, I don't know. If anybody, if anybody just said, fuck it, let's have a game and have it be goofy, 
let's just do the stupidest things that we can think of with these rules. I would love to hear about it. Um, but all, all jokes aside, though, I can see you picking up the mannerisms of the animals that you have decided to be inside of their consciousness. Because it states that you go into torpor. What happens to that consciousness of the body that you've taken over? Are they pushed out? Are they just wandering? Or are you sharing it? And that's something interesting to take into consideration. And could end up in whole types of plot lines. Because to my understanding, animals don't go to the Shadowlands. They go directly to the Umbra. The spirits of the animals. Animals don't have wraiths. That animals have spirits. So are those spirits just wandering the world while the vampire has decided to ride them? No. Anyway, I think that's enough blathering about animalism and what they've done with it. I love it. I, I'm, a, I'm a fan, as I am prone to say. Um, I do like the way that it was hidden. Uh, I do like the way that it was handled. And I look forward to seeing more um, amazing adaptations from the World of Darkness team. Um, at that, I am Voivode Maquette. This is our World of Darkness, and we have taken a look at animalism. Good evening.